The big problem, and we have a few problems, but like one major problem is that we're guided almost solely by GDP, stock market prices, and profitability. And the issue is that with AI and new technologies, those things are just going to keep on going up and up. Uh, well, not the stock market. I mean, the stock market eventually is not going to stop going up. <laughs> but GDP is going to keep going up um, even as more and more Americans get displaced. You know, I mean, if you have like trucks magically drive themselves, that's like a boon to GDP because you can get the same work done without having to spend all this money <laughs> on humans. Um, but is that going to be good for human well-being? In a lot of communities, it's going to be devastating for human well-being. So we need new measurements that actually correspond to human well-being. Things like uh, median income and wealth, uh, levels of engagement with work, mental health and freedom from substance abuse, childhood success rates, yes. environmental quality, uh, proportion of elderly and quality situations. So you can map these things and say, hey, like we need to start driving our economy towards human well-being. We need to make the market serve us as opposed to having us all serve the market. Because if it's us all serving the market, we are going to be screwed. Because the market is going to zero out the truck drivers, it's going to zero out the accountants, it's going to zero out a lot of people upcoming. Uh, AI is just now hitting a point where it's going to be able to assume the roles of the hundreds of thousands of call center workers and bookkeepers and a lot of other things that we have a lot of people doing right now. So, the, so we need to have new measurements for the economy that correspond to our well-being and then start driving in that direction. And the great thing here is that this would free up these corporations to start doing things that help people. Right now, I know CEOs and board members and they say, my hands are tied because I must optimize for one variable. Like shareholder. Yeah, quarterly profitability, shareholder value, like which are tied together. So if there's something else, I can maybe get away with it for like one quarter. If uh, things are going really well, I can like do something on the side and be like, it was good PR. <laughs> but the, so we need to fundamentally change the way that uh, yeah. the goalposts are set up if we want to reorient towards an economy that will serve us in uh, what is, again, the greatest technological shift in human history. Yeah. The realigning of the goalposts is like, right now, this rock is so small, it's just takes 40 days to sail around this rock and the geopolitical leadership is kind of overthrowing the we are one mentality and the prioritization of markets is overthrowing the humanity. Yes. And these things being paired together, they're making the goalposts about money and about geopolitical leadership and ownership and, 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 and control and things like that, which I think a lot of people are racing towards, but at the same time, it's putting a back seat on humanity, putting a back seat on the mentality of shifting the goalposts a little bit towards humanity. What would that do? How would that change the world for us? And you know, you're also working on a digital social credit in yes. that direction as well, which you know, this is another really cool pillar. It acts as kind of you know, you're doing some tokenomics here. Well, so you have to look at the the issues on the ground because you know, as a startup guy, I'm always like, okay, there's like the the stuff in the boardroom and the you know the whiteboard and then it's like what's happening on the ground so what's happening on the ground right now is that again more and more american men are leaving the workforce and men tend to deteriorate it without work um, we i'll include myself because you know i'm a guy and i resemble this um, the first thing we tend to do is play a lot of video games it's like 75 percent of this now freed up time goes to video games and this is like a lost meaning or purpose in life so now what do we turn to yeah just an idle dude like the, the progression seems to go by the numbers because I'm a very data driven guy. It's a lot of video games, it works well in your 20s, but then you start getting sad in your 30s. And then when you start getting sad in your 30s, you go to drugs, alcohol, um, self destructive behavior, occasional like violence and criminality, and uh, early death. That's like the, the general progression without work. It sounds fucking horrible. By the numbers, this is a different situation for men and women. Idle women do not. Uh, disintegrate into antisocial behaviors in the same ways. So you have to look at like the ground floor and say, okay, hundreds of thousands of former truck drivers uh, who now you're saying, okay, here's some money, but that doesn't solve the problem of what, what you do all day because people need structure, fulfillment, yeah. purpose, work. So if we say uh, to the market being like, hey, market, like value these people, um, it's going to be very, very difficult because the market's like, I don't really need these people. Like, uh, <laughs> at least the way the monetary market, the way the monetary market's set up. So what we have to do is, if you have these new goals for the economy, 
um, then you can say, you know what, if you uh, nurture a child, volunteer in the community, help your neighbor, give someone a ride, repair a boiler, like any of those things that move, move society's goalposts along, like install solar panels, work on infrastructure, um, then we're going to reward you. Time banking. Time banking, yeah. yeah. It's based on a system called time banking that's in effect in a couple hundred communities around the country where if you do something for someone, then you get a time dollar and then you can say, hey, I've got this time dollar, I can give it to you and then um, you have to do something for me and then people, someone's like, okay. So you create all these touch points in the economy that are independent of skill level. That is just like anyone can show up and staff your garage sale or babysit your kid. Uh, you know, like there are different things that people can do and then you tokenize those activities, you guarantee it, and as president, I will do this in 2021, you guarantee a monetary value and you say, look, these tokens have real value. Like you bring them to a bank, we'll give you a dollar for every like 10 social credits. Uh, but the beauty of it then is that um, you will tax their redemption and so people will not redeem it very often. They'll, what they'll do is they'll just build social credits and then um, they'll use the social credits with each other. Yep. Um, they'll go to businesses that will be rewarding um, positive behavior and want to be seen as like, hey, like, you know, we love it when people volunteer in the community. So if you come here, social credits, and then they get your credits and trade it to the government. <laughs> so, so, so there are all these things that can be done. Um, and you can build this parallel economy around pro-social activities um, that's accessible for people at, at every point in the skill ladder. That is the vision. Yeah. That's where we have to go. Because if we listen to the monetary market for too long... They're not going to value these things like volunteering. They're not going to value taking care of kids, taking care of elderly. My wife right now is home with our two boys who are five and two. She works harder than I do. And the, va the market value of her work is zero. Zero. You know? Yeah. And, uh, well, I guess technically if you had to hire somebody else to take care of your two kids during that time, the market value of that would be... 30, 50 bucks an hour or whatever for two kids. Yeah, I mean, you can get nannies and, and, and whatnot, though, you know, there is a difference. Oh, it's uh, like I'd, a parent. I'd, I'd, it's a, it's a, yeah. Yeah, and, a you know, there, there are many things, too, that are similar. Like, if you, you know, if you, have, um, and if you look at the way, like, the market values, for example, home health care aides, like taking care of your aging parent, you'd be like, oh, I could pay someone to do that. Uh, right now, the market rate for that is $22,000 a year and there's a turnover of 100%. Like pretty much no one wants to do that job um, of taking care of the elderly where because yeah. we remunerated at very, very low levels. Yeah. And so what, what's happening in a lot of these contexts is you look at it and uh, the market tries to seek like the lowest price point that it can get away with because, you know, and, and but that causes its own set of problems and friction. So the, the goal for us has to be to, to invigorate some of these activities for a couple of reasons. One, we need them because our society is disintegrating. Like as we're sitting here, labor force participation down, uh, our life expectancy has declined for the last two years because of a surge in suicides and drug overdoses where seven Americans are dying of opiates every this hour. This mental health shit's crazy. Yeah. And it's going to get worse if we don't figure out the automation. How we, yeah, yes, it's, it's it is all tied together. Yes, yes. Where you have Americans getting pushed into this mindset of scarcity, where they don't have the bandwidth to process things rationally, and then they become more impulsive, they make lesser decisions, they get angrier and more like, you know, xenophobic and, and, and the rest of it. I mean, if this sounds familiar, this is exactly what we're going through right now. This is a giant uh, automation story. And so we have to start owning the problem and then have real solutions that are going to be massive. That's the generational challenge. But that's why I'm running for president, to galvanize energy around real solutions instead of the, the garbage stopgaps that are being presented.